welcome everyone to my talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about Flare, which is a system that we developed with my uh, advisor at uh, Purdue University. So uh, I'm Gregory Sertel, and my advisor is Tiar Kromp. Um, also, uh, a lot of people in my group are involved in that project, so I, I don't remember. Uh, we don't have to forget them. Um, so. Purdue University is a, it's a public uh, university in Indiana, so it's pretty during the summer, uh, a little bit less during the winter, so don't be careful. And if you fly uh, across the United States, it's between uh, Indianapolis and uh, Chicago, so it's uh, in the Midwest, uh, not too far from here. Um, so we are going to talk about Apache Spark. So uh, how many of you know about Spark? Uh, are you using it? for your work, and uh, so the idea is like, how many of you use Spark with data more than 10 gigabytes? More than 100 gigabytes? More than one terabyte? Okay, so our idea is that the more we ask, I mean, the, the higher I ask, the less people were actually using Spark with uh, big data. And um, the, the goal of that talk is to show that the current uh, state of Spark is very uh, focused on big data, very large data, right? Uh, uh, a terabyte, for example. But when it comes to smaller data size, like 100 gigabytes, there is a lot of machines nowadays that can actually have that much memory. Like we have a machine at, uh, in our group that has three terabytes of memory, right? So when we have 100 terabytes of memory, uh, our uh, 100 uh, uh, gigabytes of data that we want to handle, do we actually uh, want to have? all the runtime of Spark that actually uh, is developed for distributed system. So, um, in uh, 2011, Spark was uh, developed by uh, Matteo, and um, it was at the beginning just a library, like a, a, like a kind of MyProduce high-level library that user could actually uh, handle big, di big data and uh, do data processing much more easily, but then it has been extended to be much more than just a library. It, it become a, a full framework with um, data frame that has been introduced. So data frame were kind of a different API that allow the user to build using the top uh, language or Python or Java or Scala, and then uh, there is much more uh, front end now. But when we use Spark, instead of actually computing thing, we, we build a model, then that model is optimized by Catalyst, and then some code generation happens, and finally, the code is run on, uh, on uh, your, your system through the RDD, uh, uh, the RDD uh, framework. So RDD stands for, for Resilient Distributed Dataset, and that is really used for when you have a distributed uh, system, uh, there is a well, problem with the network, so sometimes some nodes could uh, break and you have to rerun uh, re your code. So all, all of that uh, resilience is built in the RDD uh, layer. And so, like we, we want to use Spark to first uh, have very fast and efficient uh, data processing, like faster than Hadoop as it was in the day, we are going to figure out how, how fast is Spark. So, uh, for example, if we have a data set of the n-gram, which is uh, a data set containing like, statistics about world, how they appear during the, in, uh, in the book since, the, since there have been books, right? So, uh, I, I download that data set, and we are going to do some experiment on it, right? So we are going to do a, a small demo. Um, I hope everybody can see. So uh, I wrote a, a small uh, m a demo with some uh, pre-processed stuff. So uh, not, nothing very fancy, but I'm going to show you. So uh, we, have a, we say, OK, where is the file in our program where, on my computer? What is the field? So there is words, year, occurrence, and the number of books for each word. And then uh, we are going to just load it and create a temporary table uh, for the gbook, right? And here I have some, uh, uh, some uh, code to interface with Flare. So like Flare and, Scala and um, Spark are both implemented in Scala, they both run on the GVM, and to interface both of them, we just have to run uh, the GVM with the corresponding with the, the jar that we want to have. So here, I, I just have a small macro that runs uh, Java with both Spark and Flare as a, as a jar file, OK? So, okay, so we loaded. So we, have, we are using a Spark uh, 2.2. 
Um, I'm going to load our demo file. Okay. And, um, and we can create a data frame. So the data frame, uh, like we have our gbook, uh, already our gbook data frame, and we want to do some operation on top of it. So for example, we want to filter on the column word. Right, we have a column word. And we want to see how many have the word argument, for example. Right? So uh, the, the gbook file that we are loading is about two gigabytes of of uh, memory, right? So uh, for you that are using Spark, uh, it, it's supposed to be fast, so how much time it should spend to actually uh, execute that query? An idea? OK, so sometimes people say 4 seconds, 10 seconds, we, we can say, well, we have to, get, to go through the file and just filter, OK? So here first, we, we create the data frame. Nothing happened because we didn't actually request an I.O. But I'm going to time to, to ask for, sp Flair, for Spark to actually uh, t show us the result. So there is some uh, uh, launching of the data frame. Uh, at one point, we are going to see uh, a progress bar that is going to tell us what is the current state of the, of the program. Right? So stage one is being computed. Um, most likely, there is a scan and then a filter, right? So, so Spark first has to load the data in memory and then do, uh, and do the processing. So it's taking quite a, a while only for two gigabytes of memory, right? So uh, we, will we are going to see later wh what is the reason, right? Wh why uh, Spark is that slow when we say it's actually fast, when we talk about big data. So two, two gigabytes is not big data, right? So that's why... Uh, uh, Maybe all the mechanism added to Spark to handle big data do not help much in that case. And um, so a lot of my time in that talk is actually waiting for Spark to actually compute. Uh, should not, should be, uh, it, sh it should take about one minute and 20 seconds, I think, I mean, when I, when I ran the demo earlier. Uh, I had to restart my computer, so no caching and nothing, but. Okay, almost there. I think uh, th th there is no more than two states, so that should be that should be there. Okay, so we have 20 rows that are showing, so they don't show all the row, and it takes 90 seconds, right? So uh, I told you that Flare is an accelerator. So I have I have uh, at the end of my demo, I have some code that could uh, interface with uh, Flare, which is running in the GVM like uh, Spark. So right now I'm going to call Flare on my data frame. And what Flare does, return an object, which is a Flare data frame. But you have the exact same operation that you could do in Spark. So Flare is completely transparent for the Spark user. It's just transforming into a, a, another data frame with the same operation. So here I, I call uh, Flare. And we are going to have two timings. So here the timing is the time it took to actually compile the code. And then uh, here we have the time that actually runs the code. So right, we, we went from, one, uh, from 90 seconds to 4 seconds uh, by using Flare. So now the question is, okay, I'm going to go back to my, uh, oh no, I, I can, I'm going to launch a smaller, a smaller demo. So uh, we can also do uh, some uh, SQL, so uh, Spark has a, has a front end for SQL. And for example, if we do a, a little bigger query, so uh, TPCH is a benchmark that I'm going to use later, but it's an it's a, um, in industrial benchmark that tried to uh, uh, see how well SQL query work. So here I have an SQL query, which is a little bit more involved, which do filter with many uh, conditions and uh, do an aggregation on the result. Okay? And so I'm going to start by, uh, by creating the data frame. So we have uh, the second way of creating the data frame is, is using directly the SQL frontend. So here, up, same thing. So we have a data frame. And we are going to run it with, uh, with Flare first, and then we will run with Spark. So Flare is here. It's, it's a little bit more involved. So the, computation, the compilation time for our system was a little bit higher of 1.2 seconds. But then it ran also pretty fast. And if I, uh, if I run without transforming the data frame into a Flare data frame first, so it's going to run with, uh, uh, with Spark, and uh, it's going to take more than four seconds. But we, we, we can come later to see how long it took. Uh, we don't 
I don't really want to wait for that. <laughs> okay, so we, we did the demo, but now the question is, is why, why are we, um, I mean, we know that Spark has been engineered by a lot of people in the community. It has been a, a well um, optimized, so there is no reason that they could not be as fast as we are, right? So, so the, the reason is just a design decision. Like I said, Spark is made for uh, big data, and what we are doing here is only for two gigabytes or one gigabyte, so in, in, the, in that range. So they, there's two aspects. So the first one is like the RDD system. We are on, we are on one machine, right? It's on my laptop. Uh, there is like 10 gigabytes of memory. And I don't need to launch all the RDD in the background to, in case that the computation do not work to relaunch it, right? It, it, we, it's very unlikely to have memory errors. There is a lot of hardware uh, correction mechanism that can happen in my computer, and the, the chance of actually having an error here is very low. So all of that overhead is not really useful, right? So there is another aspect. It's the code generation. So uh, how the code generation work is that um, Spark is generating Java code at runtime, right? So here, for example, it's, it's a code for the um, broadcast join. So we, we don't have to go very in deep in detail, but that function is actually really generated the Java code, right? And uh, which is a piece of string, which is then compiled and then run into the RDD system. And uh, a lot of the way that it happened, there is many pipelines, right? Like, like it's parallel. We want to have many pipelines, like that one can be run on a machine, another one can be run on another machine. But in our case, same thing. We don't have multiple machines. We are in the same shared memory. So if we start to have different pipelines and we have to send data between the two pipelines, uh, like if it was on two different machines, we are actually adding a lot of overhead, right? So here, for example, is generating uh, the, the matches here is, is calling as next. It's like an iterator process. So every time in the loop, we will have a, a callback mechanism to go and ask, uh, do you, are you going to send me more data, and, and so on. So all of that is adding a lot of overhead. And at the end, when we were running the last query that I, I ran on Spark, all of that is actually extracting data from the, the iterator that I show you. So most of the time is spent decoding the in-memory representation uh, for, for the data rather than doing the computation. And I think if we go back to the computation, it should be done, right? So it, it, it took uh, 41 seconds. Okay. So all of, and most of this time has been spent into decoding the in-memory uh, data processing. So what do we do with Flare? Like, how do we achieve actually that, that performance? By, by bypassing the two, uh, the two systems that we are thinking are at fault, right? And uh, uh, like Catalyst is a, is a SQL query optimizer, it's everything is done at the high level, right? We have an SQL plan, and uh, we can apply high level optimization, and Catalyst is doing it very well. So we, we, we extract that data plan, and we do our own uh, code generation. And our code generation, instead of targeting a GVM and RDD uh, system, we uh, generate low-level C code, which is a one standalone file that actually is going to, e to compute exactly what the query was about. Right? So we generate one piece of uh, binary that can do only one thing, compute only one value, the one that was requested uh, by the user. And one of the advantages with that is that we can interface with other systems, such as TensorFlow, that do the same thing, that you can compile your code to native code and then interface them uh, very efficiently. And if we know the, the way of TensorFlow, uh, how TensorFlow is actually uh, representing its data, we can also use the same representation. And when we actually want TensorFlow to uh, execute data on the data we are actually loading. We don't have to do any transformation. We don't have to do any copy. So all of that uh, boundary between the two systems are completely uh, uh, removed. And at the end, I will do a demo with TensorFlow to, to show how it actually uh, also increases the performance very much. So um, I'm, I did a demo on some example, but uh, right now I'm going to focus on like what are the results for our system. Um, Okay, here we go. So first we are going to look on a single core uh, run machine, right? So we want to know what's the best we can do on one, one single core, one single thread. And uh, the TPCH benchmark that I mentioned before has 22 queries that are multiple uh, aggregate, uh, join operation, uh, filter, 
and uh, all of the uh, SQL uh, thing. And here are the, the, the tests are made on a data set of size 10, 12 gigabytes, right? And uh, uh, in a, in a, in a, on a machine that uh, has much more than that. So we can see that we, uh, we compare four different systems. We compare Postgres, which is a very uh, uh, old-fashioned database system, which is, uh, uh, on, uh, which is not really in-memory uh, processing, right? Uh, we compare Spark, which has been, OK, now we don't really want to use the disk. Let's put everything in memory. And uh, we compare also with Hyper, which is a state-of-the-art uh, system, which is a close, uh, it's not open source, right? Uh, they, they published some paper on how they designed the uh, uh, Hyper in, in a way, but it's uh, not open source, and it's generating LLVM code. And we uh, compare with Flare, which we generate uh, low-level C code. And we can see that there's two groups of systems. There is the one that are slow and the one that are a little bit faster. So uh, Postgres and Spark are actually very similar, even if it's a logarithm scale, so uh, sometimes Spark is still much faster than Postgres, but it's not that much, right? So the fact that we remove all the, uh, uh, the disk access and put it into memory didn't really help much in that case for Spark because we are on the one thread, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say that Spark will, uh, will not work on distributed system, but on one thread, it's actually not the best. And then uh, Hyper and Flare are almost similar on almost every query. And uh, for, um, uh, for the, the, the small difference is mainly, uh, we think, uh, small engineering details. OK. And, um, and there's also one other aspect that we can do when we, when we generate code is to improve the loading time. Because most of the time, we focus on computation. Right? But there's also the loading time that when you are on a single machine, it can be very important because you, you cannot keep all your data in, in memory when you run multiple jobs. But so when we go from CSV to actually uh, in-memory representation, we need to decode the, the, the file. And most of the time, the, that decode is done by a general purpose library. Right? You, have, you have a library that can decode any uh, CSV file. But we realize that, well, if you know that your schema is going to be one integer, then one double, then one double, you just have to generate code that first parse an integer and then parse two double. You don't have to actually have a dispatch function that every time, oh, what is the next thing, right? So what we do when we generate code, we remove all the indirection by using all the information we have statically, which is, in our case, uh, the, the relation uh, uh, schema. Okay, and so also uh, we uh, we have a packet decoder, which is a binary and columnar representation. Uh, already, uh, uh, it has been encoded for easy access, and uh, we can see that in both cases, being able to specialize your code for the given file you have, rather than using a generic purpose uh, CSV reader, give you a very uh, very big uh, advantage. Even with when we pass CSV file, we are faster than when Spark. Uh, parse uh, binary file. Okay, so now we, we have seen on one thread, but uh, we know that we have many cores on the machine, so let's try to use our machine to the full potential. Uh, so to first talk about what is the hardware we are using, so we, we did our experiment on a NUMA machine which has four sockets. Each socket has 256 gigabytes of memory, and each socket has 18, 18 cores. Okay? Um, so total, we have 100 terabytes of memory, and we can have a, a 96 uh, cores, ni 90, 96 thread. Okay. So here we uh, we do a comparison between uh, Flare and Spark on uh, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and 32 uh, thread, and uh, and we plot it. So we can see that Spark uh, on the top right has a very uh, good uh, scaling. Right. It's every time we add more thread, Spark is faster. Uh, this small curve that we are going to talk about. And, and Flare is not too bad, but a little bit uh, not as good as Spark in terms of, of uh, pure uh, uh, scaling. So the question is, why? Why that? So uh, there is a, a blog article by uh, Max Sherry that's called uh, scal Scalability But At What Cost? And cost is, um, is mean... Uh, uh, I had this in my note, and now I know. <laughs> 
Um, but it, it's, uh, the idea is how many threads do you need in Spark to beat the best one threaded uh, application, right? So if we look at, for example, uh, Q14, well, we know that even when we multiply the number of threads, at one point we will never be as fast as Flare into with one thread. So the, the cost of Spark regarding to Flare is infinity. Even if we have an infinity number of threads in Spark, we will never be as good as Flare with one thread. And the reason is because of the, all the inherent uh, bottleneck and uh, uh, overhead that I talk about in, 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 in Spark, right? So um, now we, we can try to look a little bit more uh, closely to the, to the result, but here, we have a sharp uh, decrease when we go to 16 to 32 threads. So is there any idea why, why it happens? So th the thing I remember, it, we have 18 core per socket. So when we want 32, we need to use two sockets, right? And when we start to use two sockets, now we have a problem because uh, we are in a machine which, is, which doesn't have uniform memory access. So the code we generate cannot just be the same than before, because, uh, or at least when we load data, we have to be very careful on which socket we want to load the data to avoid uh, cross-socket uh, cross communication. So here the code, the, the, uh, the result is without NUMA optimization. So we are going to, uh, yeah, so, so just to remember to have an idea is if I load my memory into the first core uh, memory band, and I want to, act to execute my code on the fourth socket, well, we have to have an, a bus access rather than a direct access to the memory. And so um, we, uh, we, uh, we added um, uh, NUMA optimization, and then we did some tests. So there is a lot of thing happening in that graphic, so we are going to take some time. So the light blue means that we run all our thread into one socket. So we did two experiments, one with one thread and one with 18 thread. Okay. And so uh, we see that while well, we have a good, uh, so the number here is, uh, is uh, speed up, right? So with 18 thread, on one socket we get 12 uh, speed up for, uh, for Q1 and 18, uh, 14 speed up for Q6. So it, it's pretty good. It's I mean, it's not uh, the full, uh, the full uh, 18 because we still have overhead and we add it, of course. But um, then what is interesting is when we, w we go to two sockets, when we use 18 thread on two sockets, we have nine on one and nine on the other. With NUMA optimization, we see that, well, it, it doesn't change much for Q1, but for Q6, we have a 22 speed up, right? So, uh, well, it, it's, there must be some uh, noise in the, in, in the computation because it's very fast, so having the speed up to be 22, it's a little bit too much, but still, why, do we, why is it more than 14? Well, the, 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 the reason is that Q6 is, is actually memory bound, right? So uh, is Q1 is CPU bound and Q6 is memory bound. So which means that when we use two sockets, we act virtually multiply by two the memory bandwidth, which make that now Q6 can can be much more efficient because it can load data twice faster, right? And uh, when we go to four socket, uh, we can see that we have uh, the same thing. Like even on four sockets, the memory bandwidth uh, uh, can be uh, can be seen. Okay. And so we we pin the thread on each socket to make sure that when I load the data on that socket, it the thread that is going to access that data is always going to be on the given socket. Okay, and uh, and um, now I'm going to talk about uh, iterations workload. So I'm not sure about the time because everything has been a little bit uh, shuffled. But uh, we should be over now. I think I have more ten minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll try to go fast for you to go get coffee. So we are going to uh, to see what what happened when we try to uh, to interface with TensorFlow. With TensorFlow, so we call our system TensorFlow as true. Um, so the overall architecture of Flare is like that. So assuming we want to interface with a system that creates a binary as we do, well, we can actually m merge everything into one big binary that is specialized data loading that is handled by Flare, and then the data processing, which is handling by two things, the uh, SQL engine and the, the, the TensorFlow binary. So TensorFlow uh, can be compiled using XLA to, uh, it's, it's a TensorFlow compiler to give us a, a low-level binary. 
Okay, so we go back to the demo. Um, so here, instead of uh, using uh, Scala, I'm going to use Python because uh, TensorFlow is, is using Python. Um, so we are going to do a query that is using a classifier here. So a classifier will be a, will be, um, a TensorFlow model, which is a simple uh, matrix multiplication uh, on data that I, I, uh, I manually, uh, I mean, uh, randomly generated. Uh, and the classifier is already be, has already been, already been trained and uh, is going to do clustering. And then we do, here it's to do a, ma a matrix, uh, a confusion matrix, so we are going to display a confusion matrix, okay? Uh, same thing, uh, I'm going to show you how it, it works. So here is my model which, that has already been trained by, uh, by me, and then I, I have coded here, just for simplicity. Uh, here is a classifier that is going to be used in the Python, so we, uh, uh, we are going to uh, use our model and, and compute and uh, get the, uh, the TF argmax, so we extract what is, uh, what is a more likely class for, for input. And um, one, is, one thing is important is how we actually generate the, uh, the binary with uh, TensorFlow is by using the code called uh, TF, uh, TF compile, right? So TF compile takes the representation in the Python uh, that Python is building, taking the graph and generate um, a binary uh, with some um, C++ header that Flare can actually parse and then uh, use uh, to, uh, to generate code. Okay, and then same thing, we have some kind of uh, um, uh, interface with the, run, with the, excuse me, the GVM that is uh, running Flare in the background. So I'm going to launch PySpark. Okay, uh, I'm going to execute the file for the demo. So my, the first demo I'm going to do is using 200 data points. So it's just because I want it to be fast. So in the file we have 200 uh, data points. Okay, so first we have to, uh, 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 to compile the, the model. Oh, so I'm going to compile the model. Oh. Here we go. So here we have a small error. It's, it's just a warning, so it has been already been done. So right now I say, okay, I, I, I told to Flare, here we go, we have the model, which is uh, the Python code that is going to be executed. Uh, because when we come back, we always, every time there is a UDF function, even for Spark, we need to register it, right? We need to, to tell uh, the, uh, which function we are, we are using. And, uh, and it is used uh, through... Uh, uh, a UDF uh, register in, in Flare as well. So I did that. So now if I create a data frame up with Spark SQL on the query, okay, here we go. Uh, up, we can run it using Spark. So same thing. Uh, here, like, like we are, uh, there is yeah, a smaller, Small warning, same thing. So here, uh, we are going to do, okay, so it took nine seconds. Let's see how it took with, uh, with Flare. Okay, Oop. Oop. 1.2, so 1.2 seconds for, for a compilation, but then the code run in 100, mi 100 microseconds, right? So uh, I can show you the code that has been generated. Actually, it's very ugly, but it, it's very fast. And um, so the thing is, well, it's only 200 points, right? So we see that the 1.2 second to compile just to 200 points is not that great because Spark takes only, f well, it takes 10 seconds. So it's, it's still better, but I mean, we, uh, we want to see what happens when we use a, a bigger, uh, bigger number. So uh, what I'm going to do is execute a, a run a file that use more, 2,000, okay. Sorry. Okay. So we have that. We are going to create our data frame. So I don't have to actually recompile the, regenerate the model like I did before because it's already cached in Flare, but uh, I, I could. It's, it's going to work the same thing. But okay. And so let's now run just Flare to start with. Up. Okay. 
So oh, same thing, compile in 1.2, and it took a little bit more time, but now we can see that it's the same, almost the same com uh, uh, computation time, just because most of the time is spent in, in the compilation process. And now if I run, I'm going to run with Spark, but I think even before the end of the, of the talk, it's not going to actually be able to terminate. So we can come back later again. OK. And so how do we achieve that, right? So uh, we, have, we, uh, we published two papers on the subject. So the one uh, in Sigmod is more about how to architect a, a query compiler. So it explains the design of the system. And then uh, one which is to be appeared in OSDI uh, that is um, uh, actually uh, like doing, I mean, the presentation I made about today is, is a little bit more detailed in, uh, in the paper. So if you want to check out, they are all uh, uh, free access uh, on the internet. And, um, and so like we, we are just using our system on, uh, on the TPCH benchmark and on some data that we can find ourselves. We would like to, see if some of you are interested to use the system on some of your data and see we can actually help you to, uh, uh, to accelerate your, your code and help us to make our system better. Uh, we, have a, we have a beta program that you, you may want to send us an email and, um, and we can maybe find something. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. I have no idea how I did in time, uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So for the question, I forgot to say that I can use the app or I can use uh, anything in the uh, do you know what's the code for the room or anything? Uh, otherwise, I, I, I'm, I'm okay to take questions. Yeah. Yes? Um, do you have a plan for licensing, like once it's uh, privately or commercial offering? Or something? Okay, so the, uh, for the question is about the licensing. So if you contact us for the beta program, uh, I, I mean, my advisor will be more in charge of that, but the, I, I think the idea will be to have uh, like a common accord to actually be able to just improve our system and. Uh, and see how it goes. Um, after, I don't, it's not open source yet, so uh, I don't know if my advisor uh, uh, want to do it at one point or not. I think it's going to happen, but right now I, I don't really have a lot of information about that. Yes? So, uh, so the caching, right now, what we generate is a standalone program. So every time we run it, uh, it, it uh, we have to rerun it. So uh, the next generation, we are going to look into distributed system because it's somehow uh, more important. And we also want to have a um, serv client server system, right? We, have, we would like to have one server that cache all the data that has already been loading, right? And then every time you have a query, instead of launching, launching a new uh, by process, we can say to that process that is already running, can you run that binary using the data that you already have uh, potentially? So we are going to add some kind of just-in-time compilation as well, based on what is available in the server, like, oh, that computation has already been done, I'm not going to do it this time, and so on. So yes, we are going to, uh, to look into, into that. Yes? Um, on uh, oh, uh, so uh, you mean on on the these queries, for example? Or? Oh, uh, like we, we are only on one machine, we, Spark never took over, right? So now if we start to do distributed, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we will have to add a lot of overhead as well. So, uh, but, but the thing also which is interesting is that even if we keep the, da um, uh, the RDD, we could generate code to be run into the RDD and keep all the distributed for Flare for Spark as well, right? So instead of using their Java implementation, we could use our implementation that still fuse some of the code. So uh, um, yeah, I, I, I have no idea how much, but I mean, right now we have a one terabyte machine and we never use much more than that, so yeah. So. Well, well, thank you. Uh, oh. Um, so the, the thing is, it depends how much is uh, your, so like we, we support everything which is a data frame, right? So if the code that you are using is doing a lot of uh, user-defined function, for example, that are defined in Python or in Scala, 
that cannot actually it's a black box even for our system, right? One of the problem with UDF it's m mostly a black box for the optimizer, but it's the same for for us. So if every time we want to call a UDF, we have to do a context switch and do a call to that function, that can be a big limitation. Yes, unless the code is rewritten in a way that can uh, um, interface more easily with our system, there is a way, but that will requ require much more uh, refactoring, right? Not as transparent that, as we would like to be right now. You know, right now it's we want to have the same user-friendly interface that Spark has, and uh, and to have just a big benefit when you want to run on a single machine. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>